Aloha, everyone. Uh, thank you, Roger, so much for um, featuring our book in the Hawaii Book and Music Festival. Um, Jennifer and I and uh, three of our contributors are really happy to be here with you today. Thank you for all of you attending. Uh, my name is Christina Bakilega. I'm a professor emerita uh, of English at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where I taught Oh, from 1983 to 2020. And I taught fairy tales and their adaptations, um, folklore and literature and cultural studies. And I am the co-editor of Inviting Interruptions, Wonder Tales in the 21st Century with Jennifer Orm. Jennifer. Thank you, Christina, and thank you, Roger, for having us. Um, I am Jennifer Orm, and I'm in Toronto, Canada right now, but I'm very happy to uh, be able to come back to Honolulu for the Book and Music Festival, even if it's just virtually for now. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Hawaii Manoa with uh, Christina, and I'm now an independent scholar and writer, and I teach also virtually for the University of Winnipeg in Manitoba, Canada right now. So thank you all again for, for joining us today and special thanks to our wonderful contributors, Nisi Shaw, Veronica Shanos, and Joellen Rock, um, all of whom from uh, all of whom you will hear from presently. So Christina and I are, as we say, the editors of Inviting Interruptions, Wonder Tales in the 21st Century. And it's a book we had a lot of fun working on. So I really wanted to do something in the early 20th century that would um, showcase the ways in which wonder tales have transformed since the 1980s and how they are transformative today and for whom. So that was my impulse in um, kind of thinking the collection uh, and and um, I really wanted to work with Jennifer to do this. Um, so do you wanna talk a little bit about stuff, Jennifer? <laughs> yes, I like talking about stuff and I love working with you, Christina. And um, one of the things that I think is, is particularly fun about the text is our title, Inviting Interruptions, uh, Wonder Tales in the 21st Century. And it's a collection of short stories and visual images, as well as visual verbal texts that all relate to fairy tales and wonder in different ways. So that's what our book is about. But the title is kind of funny. Um, we're kind of proud of it because it's playful and has multiple, even contradictory sort of uh, meanings because invitations are like requests for attention, right? Um, they can be seductive, they can be polite, they ask you to come along and join us. Interruptions, on the other hand, we see very differently usually. They're kind of rude, it's a demand for something or a demand to something to stop. Um, it's almost the opposite of an invitation. But when you put them together, an invitation to interrupt, is asking for something to stop the smooth flow of the expected, we think. And then that interruption can be a kind of invitation of itself, an invitation to shift perspective and to see a tale or the genre from a different space. And that's what most of our artists and um, writers do. And I think that we'll find that when we talk a little bit more today. So as editors, that's what we were looking for in the text that we chose. We're inviting you, the readers, to look for and revel in the kinds of interruptions the works of, in the book enact. Um, talking a little bit more about sort of intersectionality, the idea that we have multiple aspects of all of our identities. And while we think that the stories and images in our book are for everyone, we also recognize in the book that everyone is not like everyone else. Right? We all come from different starting points and we all have multiple different identities and pressures on our lives and places in the world. So bringing some of them together and inviting interruptions, we were hoping that they will all speak to each other, as Christina was saying, sort of speak to each other intertextually um, and in surprising and revealing ways. 
one of the things that's surprising about our book, we think, is this idea of bringing um, in visual art rather than just, I say, having stories. Um, you know, like Lewis Carroll's Alice, I've always wondered, you know, what is the use of books without any pictures or conversations? And for as long as I can remember, I was determined that my first book would have pictures in it, preferably color pictures. Now, Christina, of course, has already written a number of really important books in fairy tale studies and has included images in those. So I knew that she would be keen on including visual art. And luckily, the press didn't think it was a mad idea either. So we got to have our color images throughout the text, which is unusual for this kind of anthology. Now, each image is a standalone text in and of itself, um, rather than necessarily illustrating a story, which is what we're used to. Illustration has been really important to the fairy tale literary tradition, but we wanted to cast a wider net and include multiple forms. So we have, for example, photography, um, such as this image from Miwa Yanagi. We have sculpture, figurines, and paintings by the likes of Sherry Boyle. We have mixed media by Nello Hopkinson and another from Dan Talapapa McMullen, a Samoan American artist who's often in Hawaii as well. We also wanted to include visual verbal text like Joellen's that she's gonna talk about today, as well as Maya Kern's comics. So we have a whole comic book in there as well. And we even experimented a little by including a film in a book. That is, we provided a link to a short film by David Kaplan, Little Red Riding Hood. So in addition to a lot of different kinds of art and stories, we also have a wide range of creators from newly emerging artists like former UHM student Anna Kamaya and even our cover artist, Rosalind Hyatt Orm. We also have very well-established and award-winning artists like uh, Sean Tam, whose image this is. Ultimately, we chose images and stories that we thought were uh, worth conversing about, and our notes in the books um, sort of start those conversations off with our musings and questions about wonder. Wonder, yes. Uh, so that, you know, we've talked a little bit about um, the uh, the different media that we wanted to include and um, the intersectionality of these um, texts. But wonder is something else that we want to celebrate in this collection. So why don't we call this fairy tales in the 21st century? Because fairy tales immediately in our society, um, in our culture, evoke magic and disnified magic, OK? Uh, while um, we are thinking more about wonder tales, it's a more inclusive kind of genre, and maybe we'll talk more about that later. But it's also a heuristic for being in the world. Um, it's a mix of curiosity, engagement, awe, connection, humility, and um, wonder tales across culture um, mobilize these emotions and ways of relating to the world um, in transformative ways because they interrupt things as they are, as we are commonly made to perceive uh, the genre, ourselves, and the world. So that's why wonder, because in wonder, we are kind of thinking or being otherwise. And that's how all the texts in our collection spoke to us. Um, so I think, like, we've talked a lot, Jennifer, uh, or I, I have at least. And um, it's time to hear from our contributors. And um, we have, um, and I'll be muting myself while others are speaking from now on. Um, we have our first. Um, contributor is award-winning author, editor, and journalist Nisi Shaw. And she's really a bright star in American science fiction and fantasy writing. She's an advocate 
for fantastic fiction that reflects actual diversity in the world. Um, we're very excited that she's here with us today. And she contributed the story Lupine to our collection. Um, a while back, as, as I was starting to go public with my readings, I made a vow to always sing at the same time. So uh, then I had to figure out what to sing with each piece. Uh, Lupine is um, a story about youth and age. And so I wanted to sing a song from my childhood uh, called Mary Mac. Uh, I, I really should have someone else here singing it with me because it's the kind of thing where you do like hand motions and you have, it's a clapping game and, um, but I'll just do it by myself. And you, you can imagine we're clapping hands together. Oh, Mary Mac, 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 all dressed in black, black, black with silver buttons, buttons, buttons all down her back, back, back. She asked her mother, mother, mother for 15 cents, cents, cents to see the elephant jump over the fence, fence, fence. He jumped so high, high, high. He touched the sky, 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 and he never came back, back, back till the 4th of July, lie, 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 lie. That's how we did it in my neighborhood. So the story, I'll just read a few minutes from it. Once there was a little girl whose mother hated her. The mother was not a bad woman, but she had not wanted a child. And so she put her daughter into a secret prison and pretended the daughter did not exist. The father was deceived for he and the woman parted long before he would have learned she was to have a child. Soon after they separated, the mother's love for him languished and died. As for her daughter, the mother felt nothing toward her but the deepest loathing. The little girl, on the contrary, loved her mother very much because she was born to love and in her prison, she knew no one else. Lupine, as she was called, had not even a kitten or a cricket to love, not even a doll to play with. The wind from the mountains blew seeds into her lonely tower, and she nourished these into plants, flowers, and downy herbs. When her mother brought food and water, Lupine always lavished kisses on her. However, these only strengthened the woman's hatred of her beautiful child. She is young and has her whole life ahead of her. My life is passing by, faster and faster, and soon I will be dead, the mother thought. To fill Lupine's years with misery was the object of her private studies. And one day she found an answer that would serve. She gave it to Lupine as medicine, but it was really a potion containing an evil spell. Lupine suspected nothing, but complained bitterly of its awful taste. Then she coughed, her eyes rolled back into her head and she fell to the floor as if dead. The mother laughed with delight and eagerly awaited Lupine's return to wakefulness. When the daughter's eyes opened, she no longer wore her usual sweet smile. Instead, her face was ugly with disdain. The purpose of the potion spell was to make her act hatefully toward those she loved and lovingly toward those she hated. Lupine reached up to throttle her mother's neck. The woman easily eluded her and ran gleefully down the prison stairs and out of the waste with which it was surrounded. She led Lupine into the thick of civilization where her daughter would suffer the most. So the story, I'm going to talk a little bit about my story rather than read from it. Uh, it's, uh, rather you, it's, it's rather unusual for me in that it was a story that was, I wrote um, in answer to a fairy tale, not because I loved the fairy tale, but because um, I was very upset um, about the existence of the fairy tale. It's a fairy tale from the Grimm's collection that's uh, rarely reprinted now called The Jew in the Thornbush, or The Jew Among the Thorns, or The Jew in the Brambles. It depends on the translation. Um, and the long and the short of the story is that 
a, a young virtuous uh, German peasant uh, is granted three wishes uh, from a dwarf by the side of the road who he's been kind to. Uh, he's given his last penny to. Um, and he wishes for uh, uh, um, a blowpipe that will hit any bur anything he aims at, a fiddle that will make anyone who hears it dance, and uh, the power that nobody can refuse a request of his. Um, and then he makes use of these gifts to torture a Jewish man he meets by the side of the road and eventually at the next town get him hanged. Um, and that's the happy ending. So there, that, that's the end of the story. Um, everybody else presumably lives happily ever after. Um, and there we are. And it, while it was not, it was never, you know, on the level of Cinderella, it was not an unpopular story. Arthur Rackham illustrated it. Um, it, it, it was one of the 25 stories that Edgar Taylor first translated from the Grimm's in 1823, I want to say, if I'm getting that year right. So um, it was it was certainly, you know, popular enough. Um, and its existence made me angry, uh, speaking as somebody who has always loved fairy tales and grew up reading fairy tales and, and also is Jewish. Um, it was it was um, a sort of a bit of cold water in the face about uh, who this fairy, who the European fairy tale tradition belongs to. Um, and who belongs to it, um, and, um, and who gets to make use of it. Uh, and I will firmly say that it belongs to me. I grew up with those stories, but it was certainly, but um, with this story, it became apparent to me that it was not, it was not, uh, it did not envision me as one of its own. So I wrote this story and it's about uh, the Jewish man's daughter. He's a peddler, a wandering uh, a peddler, a traveling peddler, which was a fairly common occupation for Jews in 17th century Hesse, which is where I set it. Um, and with the help of a sort of neglected Hebrew mother goddess, she returns to the town 10 years later and takes revenge on the uh, German peasant and the rest of the town. Uh, it's very much a revenge story. And then at the end, she uh, takes a baby she's been nannying more or less and leaves, uh, which um, is, is a decision that I'm still, it opens with, with um, stories, Gentile stories of Jews stealing or purchasing or otherwise obtaining uh, Gentile babies. Uh, at the same time, um, when writing the story, I could not, I could not in good conscience leave the baby in the town given what happens to the town. So um, it's, it's, it's a decision I sit with that, for that, 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 that creative decision. Um, and I still go back and forth about this story because um, I know from my research, from my work, from my theorizing, from talking to other writers, that rewriting a story extends its life. It doesn't erase it, it doesn't deface it, right? You don't stop reading Bluebeard because you've read The Bloody Chamber. In fact, The Bloody Chamber really only reaches its full uh, meaning uh, if you have read Bluebeard. Um, and so this story, which is no longer being published, what was I doing revivifying it in this way? On the other hand, um, the other question I was asking myself is whom does it benefit to sanitize the European fairy tale tradition? Um, does it benefit me? I suppose so, since I grew up with it. But at the same time, it's also uh, it's it's a whitewash, right? It's also a, 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 an uh, an exoneration of um, of um, a tradition that perhaps does not deserve an exoneration. Um, that perhaps um, we should be we. Uh, we should be able to uh, understand it as bearing the marks of um, the better and the worse of European tradition and culture. And so that is the story I wrote. That's the story that I'm honored to have included in this volume. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about how I came to work with this particular fairy tale. So. I'm going to scrub through some images and then I'm going to play a little bit of um, a video recording of my section in Inviting Interruptions. And I wanted to um, 
just let you know that I, I, I think people have already said some really interesting things and, and some that I would like to build on is just, you know, how do these old stories cross our paths and why do we choose to work with them? And I would just say that for me, the story, uh, it's a Russian tale of Vasilisa and Baba Yaga. And I will say that I am mispronouncing <laughs> the name of Baba Yaga. A Russian speaker would say Baba Yaga, I believe, but um, never criticize someone for mispronouncing a word because they, that means that they encountered it when they were reading. <laughs> and since this is a book festival, we can um, celebrate even the mispronunciation of words. Um, I, this fairy tale was not known to me. I, I grew up on German fairy tales, European fairy tales, but I'd never encountered Baba Yaga, the, the witch that um, really is the most powerful one of Slavic and Russian tales. And in this story of Vasilisa, I was just really drawn to it because it was new and scary and weird to me. And um, there were some surreal qualities to it that I was really drawn to and I wanted to work with. I wanted to rewrite the story and I wanted to re-image it. I wanted to think about building a bridge between um, digital, between traditional oral tradition into storybooks, into digital media. And I think that for me, fairy tales are a really wonderful way, and we can call them wonder tales or fairy tales, but they provide for me as someone who works in digital media, a lovely bridge between old traditional storytelling methods and new ones because they anchor us. You know, there, there's a way that they anchor us in this old familiar thing and then take us into this new territory. So I am um, showing you an image of Vasilisa and then I'm gonna scrub through during the course of making this project. I made a lot of different um, images and I collaged them into many other images. So the story can be told in these complex images. Um, I will just talk you through them really quickly. This is Vasilisa grieving at the beginning of the story when her mother dies and all she has left is a little doll of his, her mother's. She's um, under the wing of stepmother and stepsisters who don't really like her and they send her off into the woods. They sort of torture her in various ways and then send her off into the woods on an impossible task to get the fire from Baba Yaga, the witch that lives in the woods. And, um, they, she navigates through her trials and tribulations with the help of this little doll that was given to her by her mother before her mother died. And then she encounters um, Baba Yaga living in the woods um, in her hut that walks around on chicken legs. And she of course has to do a bunch of tasks for Baba Yaga. She has to serve her food and do housework for her. She has to sort and separate um, poppy seeds from dirt. And I was at the time getting a MFA in graphic design. And so for me, this fairy tale was a wonderful metaphor for all of the, the long tedious tasks of working as a typographer or a designer sort up late all night, trying to fuss over graphic design elements. Um, and then she inquires of Baba Yaga, can I have the fire to bring back to my family? And here we have a moment of inviting interruptions. We have a moment of asking and questioning the, um, you know, the, the female authority figure and trying to get some answers and trying to get some help. And so I think in many ways, this fairy tale embodies that notion of interrupting and yes, in the end, uh, Baba Yaga does give Vasilisa the fire that she brings back. She gets it in a stick, um, uh, uh, in a skull that she carries in a stick back through the woods. She navigates all the way back home again with this flaming skull. And it's a bit of a story of revenge too. So I think we have some overlap in that last story where she's she brings that flaming skull home and it, it 
does um, some damage to the evil step family. But most of all, I wanted to point out this notion that I really love about fairy tales, which is that they are multivalent. They are um, these, these things that get passed through many, many ways, oral tradition, books, movies, animations, and that they are multivalent because we can stick onto them whatever we want to. You know, we have, we can take on a story and we can make it our own. And so there's this way in which stories um, keep recycling. I consider myself a remix artist. So for me, it's all about taking things and remixing them and remediating them for other formats. So um, one of the things I was doing with this remixing was I was like exploring all these, all these uh, typography, letter forms, illuminated letters, um, patterns, old Russian patterns, new digital patterns. And I ended up building this website. So it's an interactive version of the story. And I'm just gonna um, play this a smidge while I'm talking you through this a little bit. So this is an interactive website that I built 20 years ago. And it was um, built in the older version of the web in which you could not put movies or a lot of um, high resolution images. And so it has that hypertext where you can click on something in the website and it pulls up another piece of information and you kind of navigate through this in a partially hypertext way, partially scrolling um, and the center images kind of change as you click on things. And along the top, you navigate through the parts of the story. Um, and then going down the side, if you're interested, you can also navigate through um, an intellectual thesis that is, can be woven back and forth through the themes of the story. So um, I was lucky enough to work with Jack Sipes for part of this. He was um, a professor at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus at the time. And um, he took me on as an individual contract and now I'm going to play this little part of part four of the story in Bare Bones. And it is when Vasilisa encounters Baba Yaga. Uh, well, I, question about I, I, think the, I think those were really interesting uh, thoughts. I know that when I was working with my story, the Vasilisa one, that um, there are, you know, you, you encounter different versions, right? You encounter different endings. And I wasn't really comfortable with the ending in which Vasilisa brings that skull back in. She puts the skull in the, in the house with her step family and it burns them to cinders. Like, like that's where I think the cinder really is in Cinderella. <laughs> so comfortable so, with that ending. <laughs> so, um, I instead I sort of sidestep that in my ending like she puts it down leaves it there and then and then in my version I just start going through some loops of different versions of the story once there was once there was not oh you know all these versions because I mean to me that's kind of what that's where the justice is I guess is that these stories cross our paths and we get to do with them what we want we get to reshape them and draw attention to the injustices in the ways that we, that are right for our times, mm. you know? Mm. So they plop down and we, tr we transform them into things that make sense in our time, I guess. By telling these stories, we create I think a place of justice maybe. Mm -hmm. I think there's also a lot to be said about who in our culture gets to have revenge fantasies and who doesn't. Um, and I'm thinking of in Disney's Cinderella, there's a scene where Cinderella, you know, she's she's just perfect in every way. And she comes across her dog who's having a good dream and he wakes up and she says, were you chasing Lucifer, her, her stepmother's vile cat? And the dog says, yes. And she says, did you catch him this time? And the dog says, yes. And she says, that's bad. Don't do that, right? Even in, you're not even allowed to dream about taking revenge <laughs> on the people who persecute you. If you, to, to be good um, in, in certain themes. And yet, um, you know, we see in our movies, 
right? How many movies are based on white men shooting their way through dozens and dozens of evildoers because they've done something bad to his woman? Um, and yet, if um, marginalized people or wronged people don't protest in exactly the right, nonviolent, unobtrusive, convenient way, um, they're, they're dismissed. And so I think that there's a lot to be said for the violent retribution and revenge that you often get in fairy tales, because there's a lot to be said for who's allowed to even dream about that and who's not. Wow, yes. Um, this, we have, I think, just a few minutes and we have a question in the chat for everyone. Um, and um, uh, it's still early, but uh, do we see ways that Wonder Tales are responding to the global COVID-19 pandemic? I've read a few things about a turn in popular culture from the post-apocalyptic towards kindness, collaboration, different kinds of courage, not based on individualism. So just wondering, pun intended, about what you might see emerging from this collective experience that is not experienced in the same way everywhere. Of course, that's really important and part of what we've been talking about. Does anybody want to respond to that? That's a very big question. I mean, I've been thinking about how even with our title, Inviting Interruption, that, that title has assumed different meanings and, and valences in these uh, pandemic times. But, um, well, are there, yeah. I'll just take a step. Well, one thing I think we found out from the pandemic is that the world can change in a second, right? Yes. And that is why, I mean, I'm in the state of George Floyd's uh, murder. And that is why it was so powerful when that moment happened and we saw the world rising up um, and significant changes, things that we could never even consider discussing before like defunding the police or whatever. So I think that the pandemic has flipped some things in our brains about fantasy, about fantasy becoming reality, you know, about the unthinkable happening. Um, I also will just personally say that I think fairy tales might travel this in a similar way to viruses because they keep mutating, you know, so there's this way in which there's this transmission of story and then the stories mutate and the stories mutate. So I think there's something just in that that's interesting, but I don't know, you know, they say we're in a Ted Lasso world now, so that we've crossed into a sweeter, kinder <laughs> story world, I don't know. <laughs> I, Anybody I, else wanna? I know I'm just, I just would say the same thing um, that, that people, um, the reason for the insurrections um, against the police, the reason for the widespread strikes, because people realize they can. Everything has changed. And so it's changed because, because knowing that everything can change means I can change everything. Mm -hmm. And people have lost so much too that I think there's also a sense that um, there's, there's, if you've already, if you've already lost a lot, if you've already seen so many people suffer and lose a lot, um, then perhaps best not to waste any more time and strike while the iron is hot, <laughs> unintended. I, <clears throat> this conversation is becoming more and more intense and interesting. Uh, I fear that we have to stop, however. Um, I just wanted to say that the, I mean, what, what, the, what Nisi and Veronica are, and uh, Joellen were saying here at the end is, is really um, uh, germane to thinking about not just wonder tales, but the fantastic more generally as a mode of storytelling and thinking and experiencing the world that um, 
helps us to move out of whatever box we unknowingly are in or unconsciously are in and operate in all the time. So what, you know, there's escape and there's escape. These narratives have been called escapists as a way to, you know, shoo them away and say they're not very uh, meaningful but there is, we're escaping um, reality as it's supposed to be. And uh, just imagining that helps us do that then in reality in some ways. Um, I don't know how, I think the question about the pandemic is something that we'll have to, we'll have to see how that evolves. Fortunately, we have three very creative people right here Four actually with Jennifer, who's also a writer, not just a scholar. I'm just like a, yeah. but uh, who will maybe take up this um, challenge. Mm -hmm.